As was it indicated, I did start early in the educational process. Uh, actually, was involved in some of the very first bring your own device efforts in 1965. As I rode the bottom of supply cart, as my freshly minted uh, assistant uh, principal father delivered tablets and pencils the day before school opened. That was the big assignment in those days to bring your own device. Uh, it's moved a little bit beyond that. And, and I think the one thing that uh, needs to go, we've talked about boilers and, and FCAs and, and all of that, and that's all a very essential uh, underpinning. But one of the things is, is Pennsylvania in particular in our society and greater is schools represent one of the last institutions that are in the built environment. In this day and age where banks are in grocery stores, churches are in metal buildings with fiberglass steeples, so much is devolved away and gone, our schools still remain a remnant of the past or an image of the past, an image of our community's future. So the question becomes, what are what does that future want to hold? And um, okay, I see this previous one for me. And I'm gonna start just a little bit. This could take, you know, a week. Uh, I've got I'm giving myself 15 minutes, so we'll go quickly. But that was then. Uh, think about it. Most of us went to schools that were designed by someone who probably lived in a home and, and they rode a horse. If you think about a building built in the 1950s, they were probably 50 years old, 40 years old when they built it. Uh, it wasn't until 1918, I think, or 17, that New York had more cars, New York City, than it had horses. So you don't think about the pace of change, but the buildings that we're living within have so much of that. Uh, as we, as we move from very authoritative, very rigid, very uniform, um, that was the model. Uh, cells and bells, very linear, very box, uh, very industrial. And uh, so many of our buildings were still working around that, that, uh, that infrastructure. Today, uh, as you look at new buildings, uh, we're really moving into more of a collaborative, organic, adaptive type mode. And the diagram, I think the stream describes that very well, lots of rocks to go around. The diagram that goes with that is really more amorphous. You're going to hear the terms collaboration spaces, breaking down walls, uh, things of that nature. How do you do that in a building this masonry bearing was built in 1935 or built in 1951? It can be done, uh, but it is, it is something that requires some investment. So as we talk about boilers, roofs, and, and the basic safety factors of a building, how do we remake these buildings so that they can support 21st century uh, learning mo modalities? Uh, just a couple examples, uh, corridors on the one side, everybody saw those corridors, uh, corridors on the right. Uh, they're more than just moving from one space to another, they're places for interaction to take place in buildings. Uh, that in and of itself doesn't work very well with the PlanCon 1.58 grossing ratio standards that. Uh, that we have to talk about that were established in 1974. Excuse me. One of the other spaces uh, in the building, of course, is a library, a collection of books. Um, everybody in this room has one of these. They've only been out, I think, slightly over 10 years, but all the information in the world, if you trust Wikipedia or the, the veracity of it, is really accessible here. Uh, we can't buy encyclopedias. They're not in the printed mode anymore, but our libraries are still designed with, with areas for those. One of the things we found is many of the schools we've traveled around the state, not even librarians anymore. You know, we're dealing with an aid. The, the number of book circulations, the whole nature of that's changed, and those rooms are one of those greatest opportunities for change and one of the areas we're seeing the greatest change occur. Uh, so what is, the, uh, what is the role of K-12 schools? Um, Back in the day, we had students separated by ability, ability grouping, which gave you certain opportunities uh, and, and, and deficits. Uh, traditional curriculum, we had home economics, vocational arts. Uh, schools were really, students were really being prepared for the jobs to enter the, the industrial workforce. Uh, today, it's a little bit different. Uh, we're looking at unique teaching modes. How does that happen in a large seating environment? Uh, but are there, are there opportunities being lost as old curriculums are disappearing as we're trying to meet testing requirements and adapt to new technology. And in particular, what are we doing for non-college bound, or I should probably say non-four-year college bound students in that K-14 modality? Uh, other challenges and changes that we're seeing, uh, assessing the breadth of available electronic information. I kind of alluded to it, and everyone has kind of seen the uh, latest debate on, on, the, on the internet about the authenticity of the source. 
you know, what is an editorial, what is factual, and how do we teach our kids that? Expanding the curriculum concepts, we get into STEAM, uh, STEM, uh, STREAM, I've heard. Pretty soon we have an acronym for every class that's in the building. So is it a place or is it just a way of functioning? Um, so how far can we go? Um, some of the things that we're dealing with, uh, life cycle and durability, it's been talked about in 21st century convergence, the increased usage demands. Uh, one of the things we had a great discussion with the school district uh, yesterday, and that was the fact that we have facilities that are shut down for one quarter of the year. Why? How many of our students go out, out to hay, uh, you know, or go home to milk a cow? You know, that is a model that is held over from that previous industrial age, and we have a tremendous investment. Overnight, we could reduce our investments by one third, or at least by one quarter, by using our buildings more fully without doing anything else. Uh, we have issues of integrated technology, safety and security, unfortunately, and the struggle in our buildings is how do we not turn them into um, our fortified pillboxes and still keep the openness and transparentness for our students. Uh, collaborative learning, sustainability, of course, goes with that. Sustainability uh, in and of itself really is just a lot of collection of common sense. We architects were talking about that back in the 70s and 80s, and everybody looked at us and said, oh, no, the bean counters say we need cheapest first cost. Uh, at least the sustainable model has allowed us to look at those life cycle issues and make some better decisions. Again, this is the world we're in, uh, our schools, you know, things that didn't exist, uh, LinkedIn, Google, uh, YouTube, um, podcasting. Uh, even today, you know, we're, we're starting to talk about, I won't call, use the term holodex, but for those of you who are Star Trek fanatics, but when you have a, an Oculus Rift and uh, you're putting a kid in an immersive environment so you can walk around the dinosaur uh, that's moving, breathing, and talking to him, you need space to do that in, and that's not a 600, 700, 800 square foot classroom. And where does that happen within our buildings? And of course, all of these external forces are changing. They're, they're, they have more access to the students than our teachers. Our teachers have them six and a half hours a day. Um, the internet has them the other 18. So new types of learning spaces it's going to take uh, to, uh, that we're seeing to adopt this. Again, going back to the uh, plan con issue, one of the things that we find around the country in many of the, of the schools are these small group breakout spaces where we're doing small one-on-one -on -one instruction or groups of five or 10 uh, students together, perhaps uh, media enabled. There isn't a place to gain referendum limit. There isn't a place to gain uh, reimbursable capacity uh, for buildings like that. One of the most interesting, if you have a chance to visit it, it wasn't one of our projects, but one in, in Downingtown is their STEM Academy. They took a building uh, built in the early 1900s, stone building, and uh, the actual plan con capacity of this 800 student school is 200 because everything became breakout spaces or large learning areas, and it functions. Uh, and that is where I think one of the updates to plan con uh, is, the, is the greater flexibility and more of a focus on just square foot of instruction per student rather than codifying that it's going to be in certain size boxes. Uh, Computer hubs, uh, as we move into buildings, I guess I'm touching the mouse there and actually moving myself ahead. Um, you know, wireless is not always everything. There's still going to be a need for hard-coded hard um, uh, environments. There are certain things such as graphic design, CAD, prototype modeling, just can't do with a laptop or, or an iPad. You need a space to go to. But conversely, we have districts that are trying to eliminate all computers and all computer labs. Uh, gaming studios. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting introduction. Uh, this is once we finished last year. It's a reconfigurable space for focusing, and this is like Zulama Lab is what this is based around from Carnegie Mellon. Mobile apps, gaming, multimedia. Um, it's tremendously flexible space. Nothing like a traditional classroom has been in the past. Uh, even such things as uh, a black box theater. And most of the spaces I'm showing you here are renovated spaces in buildings from the 1950s and 60s. So it doesn't require us to throw everything out and build new, but it doesn't require us to rethink. Uh, black box theater, I mean, you can do anything in here. Um, multimedia, and even I see my acoustician over here shaking his head, he gets it. Um, most phenomenal spaces in a building. Uh, but then getting to shared hub, uh, this, is a, this is a STEM center recently finished. And I'll show you the next few slides. This is a basically what we would call a information commons. Um, 
It is surrounded by physics, art, uh, robotics lab, prototyping facilities, uh, but it's a breakout space where students can go to work on prep and then move back into their learning spaces. Um, this is a maker lab. This is probably the most traditional space you'll see. Um, we still have some hand tools. We still have to physically make a few things. Not everything can be a laser cutter or a 3D printer. Um, innovation lab just around the corner. Again, we're pirouetting around the same space. Um, this is the area where robotics, uh, we had, one of the requirements was to have higher ceilings so that they could do some drone programming and flying in here. And uh, uh, that's been one of the interesting things that we've seen some of our uh, middle schools have even started videotaping and uh, tracking our projects and doing weekly updates on their websites. And that's middle school kids. I mean, middle school. Um, so one of the things we're also finding is learning's happening everywhere. And one of the other spaces and buildings that's really changing is a sense of library, I mentioned, but also a cafeteria. We're seeing a lot of mergers of those spaces where the, the environment's becoming more of your Panera Bread uh, type setting. This is where you'll find the kids after school if you go into one of these places. They're sitting there with the laptops. Uh, that's where they're meeting. They need a space where they can have small or large group work, um, private versus public. Um, you know, the knowledge commons, again, that is the morphing of the library merging with the cafeteria. Uh, this one happens to be um, uh, Westmont High School uh, in Johnstown, uh, which is not necessarily what we think would be the technology center of the of the state, but it was a vision that they had. Uh, guidance you're seeing in the background, but this is um, uh, phenomenal. One of the other connections is outdoor spaces, secure outdoor spaces, you know, and unfortunately, we have a lot of great spaces around our buildings who were built in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but with the focus on security, we're locking the doors uh, and we're decoupling from the outside and doing that. Uh, student galleries, uh, this happens to be a 1958 building and it reinsertion of what had been a classroom. The removal of the wall became a uh, reconfigurable, and this wasn't the best photo, but one I had, uh, of an uh, of, uh, art display gallery. Other 21st century transformations, again, uh, the focus so often, I know the legislature is always worried about build new, build new, why can't we fix the old? Well, you we can fix the old. It's a determination of what's a good old building and what is an old building. And Scott's, uh, I think Scott's approach is one of the ways that we can get to that decision. So some of the 21st century transformations, this happens to be a 1962 library on the one side. You use the found space concept, uh, it becomes an art room. Again, we didn't build anything new in that case. Uh, a lobby, 1956 building, becomes that student uh, knowledge commons gathering space. This actually also has a, uh, a coffee clutch on one side that runs uh, 12 hours a day. Uh, even such things as taking 1959 library, which you have on the, on the uh, left, and turning it into a blended learning lab. In this particular case, the school did away with the library entirely. Uh, music rooms, I mean, modernizations in places. Um, this simply required some rethinking of space that existed and eliminations of, uh, of corridors to grow space. Even something like a mid-century uh, cafeteria, 1952 building, can be modernized at very few dollars, uh, but creates an environment that's more stimulating uh, for students. And Chris, you like this. Um, even a 1960s auditorium uh, can be remade into a modern space without the need to spend three and a half million dollars to build an all new, all new facility. Uh, but to do this, we need the funding stream these are the things that will be very difficult for our local districts if they're struggling to fund roofs, boilers, fire alarm upgrades, and life safety systems. Uh, it'll be a competing, a competing situation. Um, so with, it, with that said, uh, our second part of our presentation, I'm going to turn it over uh, to my uh, esteemed colleague here to talk a little bit about community, community involvement. One of the things we need to get the support of the communities is let them understand what it is and make them part of the decisioning process. And that community involvement uh, often can take the form, and we're, we're very much proponents of what we'll call the BAT team or building advisory team. Um, these are owner formed groups uh, that meet continually throughout the project as part of the feasibility study, as part of the schematic design, as part of the preliminary design, and all the way through construction. They are the folks that will go home. What I found is every person in a, in a meeting 
uh, we'll go home and tell five people who then tell five people else because everybody likes to know something. And so very quickly, you've got a 500 or 1,000 people in your community who have the right information. Uh, we can try and put it on the Internet. We can stream it. Uh, we can put it on websites, and those are all very good, but there's nothing like word of mouth for having a veracity, especially if it's coming from your friend or your neighbor. Uh, and so building an advisory process uh, or a team process can really work. Uh, it also needs a little bit of filter, uh, and that's always going to be the fear of the administrators, is how, you know, how do you keep these processes from getting too out of control? So there does need to be some thought to mediating and moderating the discussion processes that take place. Uh, these typically are on-site work sessions, um, you know, lock everybody away, eliminate the distractions, make sure you have all the information and questions available, uh, and then move towards, of course, the issue of uh, consensus building. One of the latest techniques that we've started to bring into these sorts of processes, this happens to be an Oculus Rift uh, hooked up to a Revit. We're doing all the work already in building these Revit uh, 3D models, this BIM modeling as they call it not much more to uh, simply interface, do a little processing, and allow, in this particular case, a board member to go inside his building and understand what it is we're talking about in terms of connectivity. In this case, it was connecting the library directly into the STEM areas with uh, overhead doors, because they really wanted to, those areas to be able to grow and, and uh, evolve uh, as, as time went along. There are a lot of techniques available that didn't ex exist uh, many years ago uh, in going to them. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't think it was intentional um, that Vern and I got paired because, you know, he's an architect that grew up in the home of an educator and superintendent. And I'm a superintendent and grew up in a home that had a motorized drawing board uh, in the basement. And my father was a mechanical draftsman initially. And I, I grew up in Ambridge um, near Pittsburgh, a mill town. And um, I, I was telling Davis Bosdo, who I have the good fortune to work with in a project we're doing, that. Um, you know, my dad had aspirations for me to be a mechanical draftsman, an architect, an engineer, something of that nature. So he always had me down there on the board um, explaining that uh, you needed to understand how things worked. And a good way to do it was to draw it. Uh, and as I got older, just as a point of interest, um, when I was looking for my first job to pay for that car insurance, he said, I don't want you working in McDonald's. I want you to go out and work with a construction crew because there's nothing worse than an architect who never built anything or a mechanical draftsman uh, who doesn't understand the life of a machinist. And uh, I think really he wanted me to carry shingles onto the roof to ensure that I'd go to college because he put me on a roofing crew. And uh, I definitely wanted to stay in school after a few summers of that. So um, a great compliment between Vern and I um, because I picked that up, and uh, when my, my father uh, you know, encouraged me to go to school, he said, why not California University of Pennsylvania? If you know anything about the, the college, they're very well known for uh, their technology education major, which actually was the industrial arts program. And um, so I went to school and came out and taught at Seneca Valley mechanical and architectural drawing. And I learned just enough about those things to know that I'm not good enough to do your jobs. Um, but I could uh, give kids that initial interest and set some of them on that pathway. So I'm flattered to be here today um, to share with you a little different perspective. And that is um, that of the superintendent, which is a new experience for me. Um, I'm just about a year and a month into the job. And I happened to come into a school district there in Grove City. Um, that, that is, is quite interesting. Uh, financially healthy, I, I do have to say. Um, they, they have quite an impressive uh, uh, capital reserve, um, committed fund balances, uh, some protection for the, the Peasers scare and OPEB as I'd call it, uh, you know, things that people are frightened about that they don't know how this is all going to pan out. But it's a district that has um, saved money for the most part somehow. And one of the ways I think they did it is um, a lack of maintenance to some degree in, in life cycle consideration for the facilities that exist. Um, we're dealing with some facilities that although we have wonderful educators and hardworking kids inside them uh, doing great things, um, they're not, uh, learning isn't compelled by the spaces in a couple of our buildings. Um, we have a late 50s built, I think 1960 opened a double loaded corridor, we call it a primary center with single pane windows and doors that won't shut all the way when it gets too cold. A uh, foundation that actually sunk the year that it was built. Six-inch elevation drops in a single classroom. Um, it's fun. 
kids like to set a ball on the floor and watch them all end up in the same place. Um, you know, literally some movement in that building that caused tears in the roof, not just leaks. So, you know, to the lawmakers that are here, or the folks representing those offices, um, I think it is a challenge. Um, you know, when I heard Scott talk about uh, doing uh, life cycle studies, um, I can't help but wonder to the question about uh, how many does PDE need uh, to do this. If, if there isn't a, a better regional approach, maybe through the IU systems, um, to put a higher level of expertise in the regions as uh, some facilities oversight, to equip districts like mine, semi-rural, that you know they're not gonna hire a director of buildings and grounds that has an engineering or, or strong construction management background necessarily as a full-time employee. But I th really think in the regions, there needs to be more attention and expertise given um, to those life cycles, to that not only development of the design and idea, but the maintenance that's appropriate to get the maximum out of those life cycles and to have um, long range planning for the time of update and replacement. Because what I'm gonna share with you now is um, the struggles in our job. Um, because you know, right now, depending on how the legislature changes or doesn't change taxation, um, you know, we're, we're in a pressure point. You know, to, to raise or not to raise taxes, how does that affect us? You know, what are the fears that it generates in a community? So the first slide I have there is what hurdles are superintendents likely to face when planning school construction projects? Um, and I'm really gonna focus on the one about community engagement, but it's important to note identification and justification of needs for modern learning spaces. You know, I came to this um, uh, program last year with Dave uh, when it was over uh, at, the, at the hotel. And each time I get into a room, you know, with a handful of folks that do this work, other architects, I know I'm privileged to work with Dave. I think uh, most of you probably know Dave. Uh, and Eccles has a long history of designing schools. But as we meet other folks, and just a little bit of time I got to talk to Vern, I realize there's a redundancy in so much that we do, at least in education. We're, we're in different places, often trying to solve the same problems. And... And that idea of, uh, of, of sharing and building off the successes of others, I think of the identification and justification of needs. One of the strategies we try to use is, can we you know, get together the van or the bus and take a couple of board members, a couple of influential community members? Can we get out there and look at things? You know, uh, I got to meet, I think it's Andrew, at, uh, um, uh, through uh, Chartiers Valley School District and the project they're doing, and Dr. Brian White, who came to the conference last time. I went to Montour and looked at the facilities that they're designing now. So the point is, we go to other schools, and we try to look, and we try to build excitement around it and see what modern spaces look like. But think about how geographically limited they are, we are. How, how far am I going to take the van or the bus? How many people can I get to go there? Dave says, great schools to see are down around Baltimore. You know, recent design of some excellent schools. How do I get people to go see that? And to that first issue there, uh, um, I brought up with some folks, and, I, and I'd share it with our state lawmakers. If you want to help save on some redundancy of cost, um, what about right up front to understand how to do the best with your planning? Not only just to build excitement for buy-in, but to, to get some imagery around the idea of what should we be doing, and how do I look at the best and share it with the rest? And when my wife goes through, I think it's the website House, house or whatever, and, uh, or even you go to some realtor site, you know, you drive past the house and you think, I want to see that, and there's a little code on the sign, and you can go in and take a virtual tour of these buildings. It's kind of like Vern showed what they're doing with the building before it's built. But I wonder why our lawmakers um, maybe haven't considered creating that repository digitized where, you know, new projects or modern projects around the state, possibly even around the, the country, maybe even beyond, that we can't digital, digitize walking tours of some of these modern spaces, but tie it to more than just the excitement of a walkthrough. When you look at house, that site, and you, and you digitally go through these beautiful homes as you're thinking of building yours, little icons light up. You know, you can click on it and you can get the name of that wall color and the paint that's used. You can click on the flooring surfaces and know what it is. You know, you can look at the materials that are used around that space. Educationally, I think you could tie to it function icons, click on it. What was the function that was compelling to the design of this room? 
And as you walk through that, I don't need to travel to Baltimore. I don't need to go to all those places. Maybe through those tours, I choose to go to a couple physically. But we could share those things, and we can touch on all the resources, and we have the technology to do it. And I challenge you to think, who do you think might be willing to pay for all that technology to build that? If I can click on that and know that that's a Sherwin-Williams paint, if I know that's an Owens Corning product, if I know where that steel came from or how that was designed, I think it could not only not cost the state money, it could potentially be dangerously profitable. You know, that uh, we don't want to only put the people in there that pay the most. But that's just a touch point on what I see as a struggle. Here I am in Grove City, and I reach out to my network, people I know, to as far as I can go, and I see some things, and I begin to work in that um, bit of a box, if you will, the Western Pennsylvania box. Uh, but I think we could see so much more, and there are a lot of folks out there that could help us tackle that first hurdle. Identification and justification of needs. Build excitement. And I think the state can then also tag to that. Did you ever go tour a facility after it was built by a year and ask an administrator, a teacher, or even an architect, if you could do it again now, what would you change in this room? There is always an answer to that question, always. So imagine when you took that tour a year after it was built, and then there was a link to a mandated um, report that schools had to do on the pros and cons of their finished design. This is working very well. We're getting more out of this than we ever expected. We would change this. This is the hurdle. This is the problem. So it would take all of this work and make it a building system. Community opinion and acceptance, that would help that a ton. But um, there's a thing that really affects that, or a couple of things, the political climate of the board. You know, how many board member seats are up this year? Who's going to put their name on the vote for a $35 million project in Grove City? You ever have those board members that hope that it passes but want to be the no vote? You know, they're like making sure that uh, there's just enough yes votes that they can get their no on the record, uh, maybe for that election. That's dangerous to play that game because a vote can flip. And then that goes to finance that can drive a lot of this. District reserves, what kind of shape are we in? I think I'm very lucky at Grove City. Excellent capital reserves and committed fund balance for some protection. It's unusual. But then again, we have almost no debt service. Our debt service will actually drop off like a cliff in 2021 from a prior project, and we're open for brand new debt service in this project. Not that you should always want that, but we don't have a long-running deep debt service. The revenue versus expenditure trends, who's going to figure that out this year? I, I know it's important work that our state lawmakers are doing on um, you know, the question about taxation. Superintendents. Um, I don't like to be the guy that's accused of having the hands in the pocket of the taxpayers. We don't want to hold on to local control just so we could take what we want when we want it. I actually hate that part of my job. But there is a very legitimate fear to a, lo a loss of local control. And um, that, that fear, and, and not, not to you know, pick on our lawmakers for some recent past and difficulty passing budgets, but that fear of putting all those eggs in that basket is very real. Peasers and um, other post-employment benefits, um, that's a conversation for another day, but it is relative to what all of you do. Because if people don't understand it, and they hear that a district like Grove City has a $54 million posted liability for Peasers, they don't know how to interpret that. And I don't know how many forums I could try to set up to get them to understand that. We don't have to pay that all off next year. There's a 50% reimbursement expected from the state, but the state doesn't allow us to post that as an expected revenue. We can only post the liability. So the reason I bring up those financial pieces, that the new uh, basic education funding formula and will there be plan con after today, the reason those are there is because they all affect my topic, which is community buy-in and engagement. The low-hanging fruit, is the fear campaign. So in any construction project, you're gonna pull people out of the weeds of a community. Millions of dollars people don't wanna spend. It's understandable. I don't mean to stereotype, let's take our senior citizens, they don't have kids in the school, or homeschoolers, things like that. Why would they have any interest in spending $35 million in Grove City in a shallow view? I think there's a lot of reasons to say they could have a great interest, but why? 
And what's the low-hanging fruit? State can't pass a budget. Plan con's gone. They're saying they're going to talk about it. I don't believe them. Funds came late last time. They may not come again. What about this Pizer stuff? What about all that? And they just grab that. They don't need to understand it. They just need to keep it on the table for conversation. And it's a fear campaign. So how do we overcome fear? We need the cultural change of confidence. I don't think the state needs to tell us they could identify every way they're going to do everything. But I think we all have to speak to a confidence of commitment to perpetuate strong public education programs. It is a priority. It's not frivolous spending. We're not going to offer you everything that you want without a lot of thought. But I think people need to know it's an unwavering commitment to take away that fear. So Grove City Area School District hosted three collaborative charrettes, and I'm going to uh, jump through this rather quickly. But I really compliment Dave and uh, Mark Scheller from Eccles. Um, they were tolerant of, of me, I think, and our group in that I came in after two years of them working through a process and a feasibility study, and it seemed like Grove City was ready to start schematic design. And a new leadership came in, and the fear campaign was out there, and it unraveled everything just enough to say, we don't have enough community buy-in. So we had to slow down our process a little bit, um, arguably at the, at the expense of a year. But we thought, how do we get these other people from lingering around the top of the weeds into an opportunity for involvement? And Mark and Dave introduced the idea of a charrette. Now, you guys are architects, some of you. I don't know if that has special meaning to you, a charrette. My community picked on me for it. They're like, what is that word, you know? But in essence, Mark Scheller explained, you know, a working activity, an opportunity for a variety of stakeholders to get together and actually have an activity-based gathering to attempt to solve a problem and present solutions. This was different than what we had done in the past. You know, telling people why it was good that we were gonna do. Having the teachers sometimes provide input. Giving an opportunity for some community members at night to provide input, talking to the board. This put them all together. So we designed three of them, and they had themes. And the first one was classroom and learning community concepts. Quite honestly, um, long story short, we, we wanted to talk about the idea of learning communities. Uh, a quick point that I shared was I have um, two sons that are two years apart, right now 17 and 15. But when my youngest son was four, so my older one six, I didn't treat my four-year-old like a four-year-old. So those of you that have multiple children in reasonably close proximity, I treated my four-year-old like a six-year-old because whatever my six-year-old was doing, my four-year-old naturally wanted to do with him. And I didn't want to differentiate my parenting at that point. And so we did the same things together. And I found that my four-year-old had milestone accomplishment earlier just by the influence of his brother. And when I bring up uh, learning communities, we talked about the design isolation of grade levels in an elementary program. Not only do we have separate classrooms, which I understand, fourth grade, fifth grade, third grade, but we even send them to those special areas separately. You know, third graders aren't in an art lab with, when fifth graders are there. We don't design the spaces to allow it. So we talked about learning communities where we had those maker spaces, we had those STEAM labs, we had those common areas for performance-based learning that can allow groups to come together so as we could differentiate to allow that potentially accelerated third grader to experience working with that fifth grader, to have that influence, and allow that fifth grader to be a teacher and look at a different perspective of what it was that they were doing. And spaces very much can control that possibility. That is a huge potential design opportunity for schools. So in this first charrette, um, we had participants pre-register through our website, which was important because we wanted to selectively group them. We wanted to have diversity in groups. We wanted to have some community members, a board member. We had a lot of teachers willingly to participate without timesheets. We had a three-hour activity. We reviewed the guiding principles, the big themes of what these learning communities uh, um, were driving us to consider. Um, we gave groups three working sessions. And those sessions were, you're in a K-1 design group. 
you're in a 2-3 design group, you're in a 4-5 design group, because those things may be different. And the building we're designing is K-5. to So um, they went into these groups, and you can see by the uh, picture that I have up there and to the side, Eccles helped us prepare a variety of um, bubble components, if you will, like from a good bubble drawing. You know, a couple different uh, uh, design shapes of classrooms, common areas, locker features, adjacencies, throughways and travel corridors, um, uh, toilet rooms, things like that. You know, the people that knew what they were doing in the K-1 design, they were putting toilet rooms in every classroom for kindergarten, you know, as far as, 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 as opposed to gang toilets in fourth and fifth grade. And, but what's interesting about it is they went in there, and you could see to the right, they were putting together in their groups, them coming from different backgrounds. And it's interesting, you know, we didn't have a lot of talk about form follows function, but what their design showed is it, it wasn't important that somebody feels that their exact map, if you will, is exactly what's going to be seen in the classroom. It's when we got to the share out portion and they talked about the functions they were trying to achieve that compelled them to manipulate the arrangement of those spaces. It helped a parent and a board member and a teacher understand the importance of adjacencies, you know, efficiency of design. They grappled with things that we didn't have to tell them about, but as they experienced the assembly and they had the best part, what I want to accomplish, why do I want cubbies in a room versus lockers outside of the room? The conversations around those things were very powerful. And from that, you know, all these different designs appeared around the room. And, and each member picked somebody to share out. And what they explained is what they wanted to accomplish in the space. Many of them conceding that this design doesn't work great for that. But we know we're trying to do this. This lady in the bottom left that's is presenting for her group is a professor at Grove City College in the Department of Education. Great perspective to have with some of our elementary teachers, with some of our board members. It was a wonderful sharing activity. Everybody in there, 60 to 70 people walked out with a much greater respect for the work of our architects and a much greater understanding for the influence design can have on learning. The uh, second charrette focused on STEAM and performance-based learning. This was different. So in a nutshell, um, what we did is we talked to them, we showed them some different videos, some examples of other spaces that we found, and we talked to them about what does it mean to learn in that science, technology, engineering, mathematics, arts, you know, what does it mean to have performance-based or project-based learning? What does it feel like in the space? What types of tools are you going to use? Do uh, you, you need to clean up when you're done? Where do you get the stuff? We did all these in the building that needs a total renovation with addition. I should have noted, 78,000 square feet, Dave, existing, and we want to add another 79,000 and, and consolidate the K-1 into the 2 to 5 right now. But a lot of debate about square footage. Why so much bigger? Well, what we did is each one of these charrettes, the building was open an hour before it started for anybody to walk around and tour the building. Group of us available to talk and walk. And we wanted them to smell the mildew in the carpets. We wanted them to, you know, see the, the Rubbermaid bins. We could have an auction for Rubbermaid bins if we ever get this project done. Because all our storage is against the walls and on floors there. But they walked around the facilities and in the steam charrette, they went to three different rotations again where they got to experience working in different types of lab spaces. They had specific project uh, parameters. They worked in, in groups, and they tried to uh, um, uh, work in a maker space, a science lab, um, kind of an engineering invention type of environment. And they had to follow those parameters and, and see what it was like to work as a kid. And they were asked to think about the furniture, the area, the storage, the materials, and what they needed to do. And again, at the end, they shared out and they thought about how meaningful space is to really trying to do this type of work. And the last one was community partners and engagement. This shred had a focus on ways in which the district can partner with community entities and attempt to create more real world learning. We put seven big ideas around the room and had seven groups that we put everybody in. Now, in this one, we did more direct invitations. Anybody can come. 
But General Electric has a, a diesel um, engine division right in our town. We invited GE. How Candy and Nut Company, if you ever heard it. They're based out of Grove City. We reached out to Slippery Rock, Westminster, and Grove City College, industries, the building trades, financial planners, and we had uh, the YMCA. We invited representatives from all of them, had our teachers, had community members, and we used those seven titles, social services, trades, professional services, industry and business, government, higher ed, theater, arts, and entertainment. And we said, this isn't the be-all, end-all, but the way this session worked was they initially worked in three stages. Their group had to take that big idea and list every breakdown of it they can think of. Social services, you know, things like the YMCA, mental health, the, the uh, hospital groups, counseling, the magistrate, whatever. They could, it was brainstorming, anything that they can think of. Stage two was then to take some of those and think about what might you do with them. You know, the obvious, career day, higher ed, you know, student teachers come in. But then what is it as obvious? How can financial planners not only come present to parents on good financial planning for uh, being prepared for college, but how can they come in and work in our personal finance classes in our business programs and train our kids to do financial planning seminars for our parents in partnership? So they came up with those varied ideas, and the last stage of it, whoops, um, the last stage of that was they presented a deep dive. Everybody took one entity, let's say business and industry, particularly targeted General Electric, and they did a deep dive. It's all the different things that we can do. Who should be the contact people? What does it take to be sustainable? How do we build a relationship that's enduring? What's the benefit to the school? What's the benefit to the industry partner? So they built a model of sustainability for a partnership. That helped our group see that these shouldn't be a flash in the pan. You can't have a partnership with as many as we listed because we couldn't sustain it. But how do we have an evolution of partnerships that are enduring? With GE sitting in the room, Hal sitting in the room, the financial planners, the YMCA in the room, they help design partnerships for the process that now we have a product at the end that as we develop this facility, because one of the questions was, how may a partnership impact design and building use beyond the school day? So that was a great tool. The charrettes, I would say, were a great um, compelling factor. Eccles said to us, they were ready for schematic design before I ever came. They helped put this all together and admittedly said that after all this work, they know it has already made change to their approach to some of the design work that they're doing right now. The last thing I have to mention, my, my presentation isn't on finances, that's probably hard to read, but I can tell you all that community engagement didn't bring the most negative people to the table. The people that don't want to find a compelling reason to say okay, and they're real people. They, they, don't, they don't like these successful steps sometimes because the fear is so great that they want to keep everybody fearful with them. The financial piece is, is a real factor. And a little plug, I think their office is a half mile away. Many of you probably worked with Jamie Doyle um, from PFM. Uh, but Jamie came out and sat with me and did, and I'm sure this is nothing new to many of you, um, she did this report on new money and the impact of this project specifically on our taxes. And in this report, she broke it down and presented it to our community through a board meeting of our existing debt service to the left and where it drops off, how we're eligible for bank eligible lending. We're lucky. Um, we could do three years of lending at less than 10 million. But the point is, is all the way to the far right, there's a scenario there that shows Grove City only raising taxes less than a half a mil for four years to go flat. So, you know, in that scenario, and a mill in Grove City is only about $170,000 total with a median of $17.25 on a household right now. A mill's not huge to us. But once people saw that, it was like a total contradiction to what the fear campaign planted into their heads. You could not have convinced people that this wasn't big tax, tax, crease, tax increases forever, every year, always going to be paying for it. Other things might beat us up, 
But for this, with an index projected at about 3.4, I only need four years of less than a half a mil to go flat on paying that mortgage, if you will. That, after the charrettes, after getting people excited about what good learning spaces look like, and then again to show them how we can manage it um, ethically and responsibly with finance, um, I think we really turned a corner with the motivation of our community and their buy-in. So, you know, there are many ways that I think, I think one of the best presentations I saw last year, and uh, Brian White and I are, are great friends. Uh, we got started as assistant principals together. Uh, but at Char Valley, Brian and his team really knocked the ball out of the park with community engagement. And last year, very new as superintendent, I came to this conference, listened to Brian. We went and met with him shortly after and thought about how can we accomplish similar goals. So sitting in this session really helped us. And then designing these charrettes was our way of doing something simpler, uh, similar to what Chartiers Valley did. So uh, it was worth coming here. And I hope that our build up from what we learned there is something that you all can share with the school districts that you work with.